This is the second video about the Byzantine army. The first one was about the equipment of the Byzantine soldier. This video is about the tactics used by the Byzantine army according to the military manual called the Tactica. When the Crusaders captured Constantinople in 1204, they collected the military manuals and other Byzantine texts and sent them to Italy, where they were translated and printed in Latin and occasionally in Italian. The Tactica that contains some later appendices by the Emperor Nikephoros Portaniatis appear to be the last and most thorough military manual and probably remained in use until the fall of Constantinople in 1204. I will read some of the paragraphs from the Tactica that deal with the organization and tactics of the Byzantine army. Chapter 4.3 the entire army must be divided into battalions, and these must be further divided into squads. Command unto these officers according to the battalion, called also a bandon, regiment called a drungus, and brigade called terma, and the other necessary posts who are the most able, that is the commanders, as well as faithful and grateful towards our Roman polity and who are regarded as the most courageous. It is no obstacle that they may be also wealthy, noble by descent and virtuous in their soul. 4.7. Stratigos is the name of the general and commander of the entire army. 4.8. There is no longer the position of the lieutenant general. Termarchis, that is, Brigadier, is the officer earlier called Merarchis, that is, the commander of a segment of the army, that is a literal meaning of Merarchis in Greek. 4.9 Drungarius, that is, Colonel, is the commander of a subdivision of that part of the army that is under the command of the Termarchis, that is, a term or brigade that consists of three regiments. The subdivision called Drungus, the regiment, is in turn divided into battalions, each under the command of an officer called Comis. 4.10. Comis, then, is the commander of a single battalion, also called a bandon. Bandon is the Latin word for flag. 4.11. Kentarchos is the commander of a hundred men, that is a captain who is under the command of the commis. So, to summarize, the army consisted of companies of a hundred men, three of these formed a battalion called a bandun, these three formed a regiment called a drungus, and three regiments formed a brigade called a turma. This is the origin of the organization of most modern armies. Four Point twenty. Cursors are called those fighting forward, those who are ahead of the ordered army formation at the start of the battle, and those who may chase after the routed enemy, those called skirmishers. 4.21. Defensors are called those who follow, who do not run or break formation, but march in rank and file to avenge the cursors, so these be turned back, as it often happens. These men may be justly called avengers. 4.56-4.57 The ancients who possessed great numbers of men those ones called hoplites, but now scutati, arranged them in battalions, says that each battalion of the scutati consisted of 16 aces, or achies, that is, files, or squads, totaling 256 men per battalion, such that every achia, that is, every squad, had 16 men, a square number. They, that is the ancients, had also great numbers of missile troops and cavalry and deployed them in the following way. 4.58 They placed the battalions of the Scutati at the front and divided their orderly formation into four divisions. 4.59 They placed the skirmishers separately as they are fast moving, either at the front to harass the enemy or at the wings, or to the rear of the first orderly infantry line formation. 4.60 
they divided the cavalry into two parts and placed it at the wings of the orderly infantry formation supporting it, ready to charge the enemy. 4.62 But in our time, the armies, being smaller and not always of the same size, rather very much smaller, it is not easy to set the size of the battalion, whether of cavalry or of infantry. 4.63 so, form the battalions in whatever number seems possible based on the number of men in your command. Each should have its own bandon, that is the flag, and its own commander, the commies, a man that should be brave, intelligent, and capable of fighting in hand-to-hand -hand combat. 4.64 Retain the number of men in a squad at 16. 4.65 Subdivide the orderly infantry formation into four parts, each under the command of a brigadier, with a more senior brigadier on the right and the bodyguard of the general always in the center. 4.68 First, separate the missile troops placing among them all those who know how to use a bow or can learn how, selecting those who are fast and young and who can jump easily wherever there is need. If the infantry numbers over 24,000 men, they can form half of it. If less, then one-third of the total number can be missile troops. 4.69 as for the rest of the infantry, divide the men into squads of 18 men, it's consisting of veteran as well as less experienced men. Take the two from its squad who are the least able and place them with a baggage train or set them other tasks. The remaining 16 men in each squad should stay in formation. Select a commander who is brave and capable for its squad. 4.70 Place the eight most capable of the men at the front and rear of its squad. 4.73 Those who are the most courageous and brave should be at the front and rear. The less able should be placed in the center of the squad. 4.74 it was for good reason that the ancients ordained the number of men in a squad to 16, because the number is sufficient and can be divided as need be in an orderly and quick way into fractions down to a single man. So the fractions would be from 16 to 8, from 8 to 4, from 4 to 2, and then from 2 to 1. 5.15 the orderly infantry formation has the capacity, through increasing or decreasing the number of ranks, to fight a double-fronted battle, when the rear ranks, turning about towards those attacking from the rear, face them as if fighting a frontal battle. 5.57 The missile troops, once called skirmishers, but now toxote, or sagittateres, can be deployed in various ways. One possibility is at the rear of each squad and in proportion to the men in the squad there can be four archers for every squad of 16 scutati, so that should the squad be rearranged into four files there may be one archer for every four scutati. The archers can be placed in the depths of the squad that is in the middle or at the wings of the orderly formation between the infantry and cavalry, or even on the very wings past the cavalry, where together with small numbers of scutati can defend the cavalry, especially if there are great numbers of missile troops. 5.58 Those armed with javelins, axes or maces should be placed behind the squads or at the wings of the orderly formation and never within the squad. Slingers should only be placed on the wings. 
place the cavalry always on the wings of the orderly infantry formation. The most capable battalions should be placed on the outside of the whole formation under their commanders. If there is a great number of cavalry, over 12,000, then the cavalry should deploy 10 deep, otherwise 5 deep. It is useful to keep a cavalry reserve to protect the baggage train. If the enemy appears in the rear, they may turn against them. If not, they may come in due course to the aid of the cavalry on the wings. 5.60 The cavalry must be placed at first spaced apart, so that if they need to redeploy, this can be easily accomplished. Command the cavalry that they should not chase the enemy nor abandon the infantry formations to the enemy retreat, just in case the enemy is using some stratagem to denude our infantry formation of cavalry, weakening it in this way. Similarly, should they become hard-pressed by the enemy, the cavalrymen should retreat to the rear of the infantry formation for their protection, and if they cannot suffer the enemy attacks at all, then they should dismount and fight as infantry. 5.62 Drill the army so that they may respond to a command whether given verbally or with a sign to march or to stand, to thin out, extending the front through subdividing the squads, to march evenly and in good order with their spear points aligned, straight ahead over any matter of terrain, and be able to tighten their formation whether in depth or in breadth, to march ad fulco. Ad fulco was the contemporary term for a testudo type formation. To join battle in good order. 5.63 The squads are thinned out or subdivided when their depth is of 16 men and you wish to extend the breadth of the infantry formation. Then you command, exit, and every other man exits the squad, thus the depth of the squad is halved, but the breadth of the infantry formation is increased, and the depth of the formation becomes eight men. Should you wish the depth to be reduced further to four men deep, then give once again the command, EXIT! Form a dense formation when the infantry formation is two to three times the distance of an arrow shot from the enemy and the battle is about to begin. Then call out, yoke, and reforming into a denser formation, shield must touch shield, forming a shield wall at the front and on the side. This formation is possible on the march as well as when the formation is not moving. 5.65 Marching ad fulco is a formation that can be used when the two armies are so close to each other that the archers are about to start shooting arrows and those at the front do not wear complete breastplates. Then call out, form a dense formation. Then those at the front come to stand next to each other so that their shields touch, covering themselves down to their knees. Those behind them lift their shields and rest them on the heads of those in front of them, covering their heads and breasts, and in this manner 
they march to join battle. 5.66 Once the enemy is at a narrow shot and battle is about to be joined, cry out, ready, and then help us, and everyone should respond at once, God. Then the archers start shooting at a high angle. As the enemy draws nearer, those among the scutati at the front that have maces, axes or javelins should throw these down, or else throw their spears or javelins at the enemy, then fight with their swords in good order, never leaving their rank to run after the enemy. Those in the following ranks, covering their heads with their shields, should support the ones in front with their spears. 12.7 it is not correct to deploy the army in a single line formation and in one fortune rest the fate of so many men, but form also a second and even a third line, especially when we have a sufficiently large army. For if you do so, whatever need arises, you may respond in a variety of ways. 12.8 be warned of what may happen, should you not take this advice, but place the army into a single line, and especially those armed with a contus. Because of the large size of the army and the great extent of the front, should uneven terrain be encountered, this formation may become uneven and undisciplined because of its great extent, and the parts of it may get out of alignment, and so prior to joining combat the formation can become undisciplined, disorganized, and chaotic. 12.9 Moreover, so the enemy outflank the wings to encircle our army, the formation, unable to receive support from the sides or rear, as there is no one to come to its aid, inevitably will turn into flight. 12.10 Even during the fighting of the battle, as it would be impossible to oversee everything because of the great extent of the front, some of the battalions may flee without being noticed, and this may set a general rout and it would be a great shame that once men start to flee, there would be no way to stop them or to turn them back, for there is no one behind to be seen who may command them to stay or who may rally them after they have turned to rout. 12.11 those that shall consider that they have met with success while deployed in a single line formation, should they advance, the line may lose its cohesion, especially should they chase the retreating enemy in a disorderly fashion. Then it has happened that the retreating enemy will suddenly turn about with renewed strength as part of a stratagem, and those formerly victorious may now turn to rout, with no one available, as already said, to answer back the enemy that has suddenly turned around. 12.15 So that to form a double line formation, such that the second line may come to the aid of the first, has many and great advantages, as can be easily proven. To start with, those fighting at the front feel safer, knowing that they have a second line to the rear, and so they fight more courageously. Similarly, those at the wings, being covered by other units, can focus their attention at those in front of them. The other advantage is that those in the front line, whose courage is failing, will not just run, as they are being under the eye of those behind them, and this has great and useful consequences during the battle. 12.16 Yet, should the first line break and retreat, as it often happens, the retreating men may find refuge in the second line, and there continue to fight against the advancing enemy. 12.9 Indeed, as the enemy formation after the initial fight may have become disorderly as it advances, our second line will stand in good order and will have the advantage over the disorderly, chaotic advance of our enemy. 12.28 
deploy the first line in the following way. On the left, where the enemy may attempt to outflank us, place two to three battalions to guard our wing. Additionally, place there also one or two battalions of archers that they may advance to outflank the enemy. Do the same on the right wing. 12.29 The second line should have one-third of the entire force. Like the first line, it should also consist of four subdivisions. This should be placed at a narrow shot from each other. These formations should be ready to fight against every side and those at the front should be as well armed as those at the rear. So that even if the enemy appears to our rear, they may be capable of defending both from the front and the rear. 12.30 Additionally, you should place a battalion on either side at the distance of an arrow shot further back to act as a rear guard as in the third line. 12.31 It is necessary that the gaps between the four subdivisions of the second line are filled each by one battalion fully extended or else by cavalry form two ranks deep or if possible four ranks deep in such a way that the gaps between the four units of the second line may be bridged and the entire second line can be united and formed into a single body so as to preserve its order on the march. These three battalions, the ones between the four formations of the second line, will be the rally points and will place amidst the ranks anyone retreating from the first line. 12.32 But if you do not have too great an army, rather a force between five and ten to twelve thousand men, do not make the second line of four parts but only of two, with only a central place to rally those retreating from the front line. 12.33 And if you have fewer than five thousand men, then make the second line of just a single part. 12.34 Moreover, we recommend that you keep three to four battalions on either side of your army as ambushers to prevent the enemy from sneaking up on our flanks and these may be used besides to sneak upon the enemy wings if there is suitable ground. 12.35 Take note that attacks on the flanks and the rear of the enemy, if they are successful and well-timed, they are more effective and necessary than frontal attacks. Indeed, if the enemy are fewer in number and suddenly perceive themselves under threat of encirclement, through such attacks they suffer great losses, not having easy answers against such a turn of affairs. Even if the enemy is equal in number or even greater in number, they suffer agony and fear, afraid that those threatening their flanks and rear may be great in numbers. Twelve point forty five in battle. You need not make the depth of the line formation greater than 8 to 10 men, even if the battalions are inexperienced, nor should the depth be less than 5 men deep, even for veteran battalions. 12.64 The lieutenant general and the brigadiers should stand at a distance of one or two arrow shots from the enemy, along with their flags, to oversee their commands and preserve the order of the army formations. Once the battle commences, they should be protected by their own bodyguards. 12.65 The general, until battle is joined, should oversee the order of the army formation and observe the movements of the enemy army. But once battle has been joined, then he should join his bodyguard not to fight, but to oversee and ensure the good order and discipline of the first and second lines, and he should take position at the center of the second line. 14.28 should you decide to fight a battle, you must above all seek a ground that is appropriate, 
open and flat for the contrariety. You must not neglect to search left and right and well beyond to the rear for two to three days before the battle and also the nearby hills for pits, whether natural or man-made, and for any potential traps. And on the day of the battle, you must place sentries on the field of battle who can spy upon the enemy from a distance of two to four miles. They should not only observe the movements of the enemy and provide information, but they must also keep a watchful eye for the arrival of enemy reinforcements.